a very good afternoon to you all and welcome to our webinar on stop and think harnessing the power of thinking in today's fast paced world we normally tend to become more oriented towards doing rather than thinking well since you are already attending this webinar i am sure you are very well aware of the importance of having crisp and clear thinking skills rather than just doing mechanical tasks this webinar will help you identify your current thinking style and will guide you on how to mold your thinking abilities as per the situation at hand without much further ado let me introduce our esteemed expert mr prasad desh pande prasad is the ceo at empowered learning systems a consultancy focusing on strategic planning leadership development and organizational processes he brings over 25 years of experience of working in india and internationally in mauritius oman dubai and sri lanka to name a few he has worked as a facilitator consultant and executive coach with business owners ceos and senior managers in india and overseas before we begin i would like to remind you all that you can send in your questions using the questions section on the control panel to the right of your screen during the course of the webinar we will take these up one by one post prasad stock our best attempt would be to answer as many questions as possible we hope that you enjoy the webinar and take home some key learning which you can implement immediately i would now like to hand over to prasad um thank you shrey and hello my name is prasad deshpande and i'm really happy to be here with all of you talking about something that's really fascinating and one which is very close to my heart which is thinking like everything which is important to us thinking is something that we sometimes take for granted in fact when was the last time that either one of us here ever spent time thinking about the way we think precisely it isn't something that we do very often but in my view thinking about the way we think is going to be one of the most important things or activities that we can do one of the most important areas that we need to be aware of because the way we think influences the way we behave and today behavior is everything why is it so important for us to understand how we think it has always been important of course but it's even more so today because we live in what we call as a vuka world some of you might know what vuka means and this illustration is you know a bit of a storm that encompasses most of our lives today things are changing rapidly quickly and fast and all of you whatever you are whether you just whether you're in college you left it your middle management senior management we all have experienced the effects of what we mean by a vuka world so what does vuka stand for vuka stands for volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous the world is volatile for example oil prices go up and down there's demonetization things that happen when you're not prepared for them uncertain there's so much uncertainty going on in the world today uh, you know we hear stories of ai machine learning different new jobs what's going to happen for example just recently Procter and Gamble reduced the price of the Gillette blades by almost 10%. That's never happened, and the only reason they've done that is because Walmart and Amazon, sorry, is now getting into retail. That's the power of online in today's world. C is complexity. Things are complex today. The variables are increasing. It's not so easy today to manage things as much as it used to be earlier. um if you're in business you have a new product and a competitor very quickly comes up with another throwing strings in disarray for you so things are complex and ambiguous again 
everyone talks about AI, but no one really knows what AI is going to do. The road isn't clear. The, the path before us isn't clear. So we're living in a world that has all these elements. But this is also a world which is full of opportunity. I strongly believe this. In fact, this is probably the best time for most of us to be around because when things are turbulent, that's when we have opportunity. An opportunity is meant for those who think, who can think through things, who can understand where they are, and understand how to engage with other people. The way we think influences the way we behave. And for all the critical skills that we need in the 21st century, to my mind, thinking is probably ranks way up on the list. In, when you're looking at VUCA or any other kind of situation, there's so many things which are outside our control. But there's one thing that we have, which is in our control, a resource, resource that we have. That's our brain. That's, that's who we are. That's how we think. That's completely in our control. So it makes sense today to spend a little time understanding and becoming aware of how we think so that we can use what we have to be more effective in engaging with situations and people. Thinking helps us, and I'll repeat this, thinking helps us engage more effectively with situations and with people. Two of the most important things that we need to do. Yeah. We are who we are. By the time we're 18, we can't change really. I mean, we can if we really want to, but we can't. We are who we are. And two factors that come in the way of we are who we are. Nature and nurture. What does nature mean and what does nurture mean? Um, nature is, is genetics. And if, some, if someone in your family is very good at maths or singing or, you know, even drama, usually that gets handed down. These are traits that are passed down the line. Um, nurturing is, of course, our upbringing at home, at college, at university, the first job we take, that's nurturing. And there's always been a debate for the last 400 years, which of these two factors actually is more important, nature or nurture? And as you've guessed it, it's neither. Both nature and nurture are equally important. For example, but between the two, we strongly believe and this debate is going on, as I, as I mentioned, the last 400 years. Name, nurture does make a shade more important for us than nurture. And that's, that's a positive sign because it gives us hope that in organizations, if we can manage nurturing well, people will change. But between nature and nurture, what, what happens is the outliers, for example, like, you know, the great the mathematics Srinivas Ramanujan, that you've heard of, about. There's also, for example, the Kenyan runners who have won every 10,000 meter event since 1966 with Chipchenyo, won the gold medal. And one of the reasons is that they come from a small tribe of Kalanjan in, in the Rift Valley in East Africa. And if you look at the nurturing that they've had, so, you know, it's low oxygen, they train there. And each and every one of them is actually a superior runner, primarily because of nature. So at outliers between nature and nurture, nature actually plays a bigger role. But nature and nurture play a strong role in shaping how we think. So how do we think? What are the factors that drive us into thinking? And what does thinking mean? What I'm going to share with you is, is a model called whole brain thinking, which was developed by Ned Herman. Ned Herman was a polymath, a genius, who was head of GE's uh, management development center. But Ned Herman was a sculptor, poet, painter, singer. Ned Herman could have been excellent in any one of these fields, but he chose to be good at all of them. And one of the questions he asked himself was, why, if I'm so smart, why am I smart in a, in, in why am I not smart in everything? 
why am I smart in a few things, but I'm not smart in the sun? And there was no answer for that. So he worked on, he built on the, the work of two Nobel Prize winning scientists, McLean and Sperry, and came up with this whole brain thinking model. What's the model? According to Len Herman, we're a combination of four independent thinking styles, all of which are very, very important, equally important. As you can see over here, there are four different cells, rational, experimental, safekeeping, and feeling cells. Now, these four quadrants can be looked, can be considered to be four rooms in a house. When we're born, we're born whole. But because of nature and nurture, some of us prefer one room. Some of us are comfortable in two rooms, which could be rational safekeeping. Some of us are comfortable in three rooms. And 4% of us are comfortable in all four rooms. And what's important to recognize over here as we go forward is we're talking about preferences. We're not discussing competencies. This whole conversation is not about competencies. Competencies is who you are, your skills. Preferences is what guides you there. Competencies are about today. Preferences define the competencies tomorrow. So we have preferences. We have nature and nurture. We also have dominance, just as we are left-handed or right-handed. We also have dominant either in any one of those four quadrants. And these dominances, preferences, define the way we see the world. We all see the world from a lens. The lens with which we see the world defines how we see the world. For, some, for example, some of us who are more dominant in blue, the colors are important, are rational. Focus on logic and data. For us, it's about being concrete and being specific. We are task-based. So what we want to do is complete the task and move on. We will never take any decision which is not based on logic. We will always focus on, on activities that give us a result. Okay. So therefore, if you have a boss who's high blue, you find that he's very specific, number driven, and not given to chit chat too much. Okay. He's always, after a point of time, if you go to him with a proposal, he'll, after some time, he'll always ask you, okay, so what's the point? What's going on here? They ask the questions, what and why? Because people who are high blue or rational need to understand the basis of everything. Why do we do what we do? It's just who they are. They're very good at crisis management situations and getting things done. They're good at what we call as critical thinking. So who? I remember we normally take choose professions that, that we get attracted to. So people who are high blue are typically in finance, accounting, scientists, um, you know, doc, surgeons, usually have a higher, lawyers, usually have a higher proportion of blue thinking because they're attracted, attracted to logic and results. Those of us who are high in green, dominant in green, focus on, on, on details, process, structure, People who are high green love to plan. For them, if they're managers, they like to preserve the status quo. They get into the details. They're very reliable, they're very neat, organized. They're safe keepers, they avoid risk. For them, the whole point of planning is to ensure that there are no surprises. People who are dominant in green can be great resources in getting things done. If you're in sales and you're high green, your customers love you. Because there are no surprises, you will always be consistent in your approach. If you're a product manager, your high green will probably ensure that projects are completed on time because you have a high focus on implementation and getting things done. But the challenge with people who are high green is that they're difficult to change. It's not easy for them to change a process overnight. For them, it's probably the toughest thing they do. So if you have people in your organization, your colleagues who are high green, who fit some of these characteristics, you will find that if you want to ask them for anything, give them time. You can't go to him suddenly if he's high green and ask him, would you come out for a movie with me? It's not going to happen. 
It has to be scheduled, it has to be planned. And that is very, very important for them, right? Those of us who are high read focus on emotions, feelings. We ask the question, whom? Just as those of us high green ask the question, how? How does it work? Those of us who are high red want to understand who is involved, what's going on here. We're very intuitive. People who are high red, when they walk into a room, can immediately sense the temperature of the room. And if you're in sales, for example, and you get into a room when you're addressing set of customers and you see the temperature of the room and you sense something's amiss, you might change your approach immediately and save the day because that's that's who you are. Um, harmony is important so these are good team players, they get things done, they're very participative. If you're a leader and you're high red, your natural tendency would be involve others, get them in. And you're always concerned to see if everybody's engaged. If they're not, you find out. Typically, people who are high red, leaders who are high red, will probably know more about the personal details of people than anyone else. I knew someone, for example, who was high red, was based in Bombay, and he's when he joined an organization, he spent his first one month talking to people, and he was always asking, he would always ask a personal question. So at the end of the month, he knew more about people individually and personally than anyone else. For example, if you ask, where does he stay? He might say, well, um, I know he stays in Kandavli East. You ask us someone who's a boss who's high blue, where does he stay? He says, well, I don't know. He'd be at a loss. I mean, yeah, sure, somewhere, you know, further down Andheri or some other place. Um, it's not important to a person who's high blue. Not that he doesn't care. It's just that these details are not important. So the way we think influences the way we, we what we consider as important, what we prioritize, how we manage our time, because that's the lens with which we see the world. Those of us who are high yellow, for example, focus on, on the future. We love to take risks because we're big picture thinkers. Okay. A person who's high yellow, for example, never focus, never worries about risk because they have a longer term horizon with which we see things. So they're resilient. If things don't work, they will experiment. If it doesn't work, they'll do something again. They'll keep on going because what they want is they focus on the outcome, the vision of getting things done. So a person who's high red, for yellow, for example, would be more of a risk taker, an entrepreneur, a person who takes calculated risk because for them, not taking a risk is bigger than not doing anything, status quo. They're able to zoom in and zoom out. A person who's high yellow, for example, has a bigger picture view of things. They like to scale up. Every one of my of the people I've known, the CEOs who've taken risks, who've initiated new things, always had a higher degree of yellow in their thinking. It's uncanny when you look at that. So we have, these are four rooms in a house. Some of us prefer one, two, three, four rooms. Some of us don't. So the point of, of, of the exercise here is to identify to what degree, to what extent, are you a combination of four different selves? And if I know that, I'll be able to engage with people far more effectively. When you have 15 people in a room, we're all whole brain. What does that mean? That means that, you know, everyone has some component of thinking available to them that allows them to see things differently. So if you're a whole brain organization or a whole brain team, you'll be able to deal with situations and people far more effectively. The point of this whole conversation is to share with you is that some of us might be, you know, far more blue and less red, then red becomes my area of opportunity. In fact, there are two different types or four different types of thinking, as you'll see. For example, you know, we have reptilian, limbic, and neocortex thinking. This is based on neuroscience, a research by McLean. What does this mean? It means when we're born, you know, initially we have a reptilian brain. That's our first type of brain, no emotions. Crocodiles, sharks are very reptilian. No emotions at all. Limbic, that's mammalian, that's full of emotion. And we have neocortex as a thinking brain. So we're a combination of three types of brains. And our flight versus fight. 
our ability to think has roots in our evolutionary past. Okay. That's where the thinking in the limbic and the neocortex comes in. In fact, if you see, we have four different types of thinking. Those of, those of us who are more dominant in blue and yellow are cerebral, which means intellectual. Those of us who are more dominant in green and red are limbic, which means we're action driven. We like to get things done. Those of us who are more blue and green are left brain, which means we're detailed. Typical executives who want to get things done, competent in tasks, but unable to appreciate the changes that happen in the world around us. Those of us who are more yellow and red can see patterns, can understand, look at opportunities when we see them, can make connections that are important. So we, a, so we have cerebral, limbic, left and right brain thinking. What's important as we go forward is to recognize and understand what kind of thinking defines me? How do I see the world? And then how do I engage with people? Some of us who are more blue and red won't understand someone who's high red, who thinks differently than you. The key to engagement is understanding how people think, because when we understand how they think, we don't make assumptions, we don't make prejudices, we don't judge people. In my workshops, and when I engage with people, I always request them, once they get there, uh, you know, understand how they think, uh, it's really important for them to, to ask themselves, Okay. What can I do to engage with someone who thinks differently than me and therefore whom I instinctively may not want to engage with? We don't like everyone and sometimes we don't like people who think differently than us. But we learn most from those who think differently than us. We learn most from those who are different than us. So managing, so there are so many different types of diversity, gentlemen. You know, there's gender diversity, and we all know about that. But the most important kind of diversity that we need to manage and harness and recognize is cognitive diversity. Every form, every type of thinking is available in our organizations, and we just need to reach out and ensure that we engage more effectively. In fact, like we said, 7% of us are one mind, 60% of us are two minds. We think is dominant in two different quarters. 30% of three minds and 3% of four minds. They're whole brained. You know, they can actually look at all four quadrants equally. And that gives them certain advantages that are important for us to recognize. So as we, you know, as we come as I come to the end of this conversation, what I want to share with you, gentlemen and ladies, is that we have four different types of brains. I need to use all the brains I have, but also those I can borrow. Um, if I can leverage the cognitive thinking of my teammates and people around me, my customers and everyone around me, because I'm aware of how I think, I'd be far more effective to, to deal and engage in a world which is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous and make most of the opportunities present to me. Right? And how do we learn? So the next question is, Prasad, that's all, we, all, that's all very well, but how do I know? How I think. Well, you can. There is an instrument called Herman Brain Dominance Instruments, which tells us very accurate HBDI, we call it, which we, you know, we've covered 5,000 people in India and touched over 100 organizations. And this tells you very accurately how you think and also how you need to engage with others. It's very detailed. There's an app as well, which we have, which enables people to engage with others very effectively. Um, the Netship, which app which is available on iOS and Android. So after this session, if you are interested, you, know, you will receive a mail um, which has the process uh, which tells you exactly how you could you know, uh, make your, how you could take advantage of this and identify how you think. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad, uh, for that insightful session. Um, I, I think we have a few questions which have already come in. So uh, let me directly move on to the questions that the audience have asked. Sure. Okay. So uh, I think uh, the first question is, uh, how can we 
change the degree of of you know our thinking uh, how can we uh, you know is there any exercise to do that and how do we move from maybe being one quadrant or two quadrant to being more than that that's a great question in fact um, the important thing is once you're aware of how you think through the hpdi um, the quadrants where you have low scores where you're not present are actually areas of opportunity so you can actually stretch your thinking in different quadrants and make most of you know uh, being whole brain now the, the key is that you know you don't have to be uh, whole brain all the time you can take advantage of those who are around you who think differently and engage them as well so as long as you have a whole brain team that's also great okay and uh, 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 so you know can you give a example uh, you know this is actually the next question uh, can you give an yeah. example of a situation where uh, you know uh, we, we uh, either you or one of your team members has been able to um, expand uh, you know the thinking uh, from one dominant quadrant to maybe another one or two dominant quadrants Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's that's great. I'll give you a couple of examples. Okay. Um, you see, one of the questions, you see, I'm low on green, Shrey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which, what does that mean? It means that um, I don't like administering things, I don't like planning, and I don't like to focus on the details. Okay. Now, because I'm aware of this uh, lacuna or this, you know, aspect of the way I think, when I run great workshops, when I run complicated workshops or this thing, I spend a lot of time in terms of uh, uh, focusing on how to be more green. In fact, I'm more green than most people around me because I take the extra effort and involve people in my team who are far, who think far differently than me. In fact, my colleague of mine who is far more green than I am, I always take his views, I listen to him and I allow him to sort of drive this so that you know, we, we come out with a, with a whole brain the execution of the program. And this willingness uh, to uh, use the resources for the people and take their help is, uh, is very large, is very important part of collaborating and ensuring that you get the most out of what you do. And through the process, actually, I've learned to be far more green than what I am right now. It's just that when it's not required, I don't choose to and I don't need to be there. But when required, I step up because I know I don't think that way. Straight, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it fairly does. So, um, so moving on uh, to the next question is uh, um, expanding our thinking, okay, uh, to meet all quadrants and adapting to the situation which is, um, uh, you know, at hand. Uh, would it mean that we have no indiv individuality? And would it mean that we are just, you know, being more uh, adaptive and being trying to be like everyone else rather than holding on to our individuality? Not really. Let me just go back to this uh, for this picture. Do you see this? Yeah, the slide here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, suppose um, not at all. In fact, it helps us be become more complete as individuals. See, we are who we are. Which means that, for example, if I'm very high blue, I'm going to be more analytical than anyone else, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's how it is. That's who I am. And that's the value that I bring to any given situation. For example, I'll give an example. We do a lot of work with financial analysts in the, in the financial sector. And many of these financial analysts of mutual fund, uh, you know, managers, uh, people who run mutual funds are very blue. They have to be. Okay. Now, when I was coaching someone who was very high blue and he was very low on red, one of the things he realized that by stretching to red to manage his own team and to engage with other people, especially, you know, uh, corporations and, and other people who depend on his advice and, and analysis, didn't make him less blue. It just made him more effective as an individual. So coming back to your question, it doesn't make you, it doesn't subsume who you are. It just adds one more quiver in your arrow. It just adds more capability to you as you take this forward. So you are who you are. That doesn't change, but you become situationally more effective. So the key is it doesn't change who you are. 
but it makes you situationally more whole brain. That's the that's the most important thing I like to share with you, which means you're more effective. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, like the examples of the mutual fund manager you were giving, uh, we have a, a, a participant who who is asking, how do you relate your type of thinking to your nature of work? Um, I mean, if he he's asking that if 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 you're dominant in a particular quadrant, does it mean that you yeah. should only be working in those related areas? But there, are, there are, that's a really good question. Okay. Now let me ask. Let me let me make an observation. Many of us actually are very good at things we don't like doing. Would you agree with that? The answer is yes. Right. Just because I'm very good at something doesn't mean I actually like it. Okay. The second question is that if I'm engaged in in a in activities that meets my, for example, my uh, the mental demands of the quadrant over there, I'm likely to be very, very good at it. Okay, I'm likely to enjoy my work. I'm likely to be more effective. Okay, um, but if I'm naturally competent, for example, let's take law. Now, law requires high degree of uh, attention to detail as well as well as analytical thinking. And if I'm if I'm not if I'm low on on uh, blue and green okay over a period of time it might be difficult but because i'm naturally competent i might start becoming better at that and stretch myself into these two quadrants and therefore become a better lawyer than what i am today but if i'm naturally if i think that way if i'm if i'm blue and green and i get into law the effort required for me to master the complexity of these two subjects will be less and therefore i'm likely to be more effective so yes, in a way, uh, it does make sense to engage in work that's in line with the way you think. So you should seek out work, even within the role that you have, that's more or less in line with what you think. It'll give you far more satisfaction. For example, I know a chartered accountant who, who's a CA of the firm, who, who's a CA for the firm, who's very yellow and red, and he does, apart from managing his uh, the CFO, you know, his job very, very well. Um, there's a lot of work which makes him utilize within the organization is yellow and red. He organizes picnics. He looks at uh, the strategy as well. And he does a number of stuff that, you know, help him engage his other areas of thinking. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the next question is uh, talking about uh, uh, a dilemma about a decision which has already been made and okay. uh, you know for example the decision you know lies between uh, say uh, some quantifiable parameter and an emotional aspect and uh, you yeah. know you find a midway for that so does that mean that you know if, if you're in this kind of a dilemma does it mean that you're already thinking with different quadrants uh, you know this would might fall in blue and red so could you come again, please, Shreya? I didn't quite understand the question. Sure. sure. So um, uh, if you're having a dilemma, okay, about a decision that you have to make, which is right. uh, uh, dependent upon some quantifiable parameter or which is dependent right. upon some emotional aspect. Yes. Okay. And you're, you're juggling and balancing yourself uh, between these two aspects. So does it already mean that you're thinking with, um, you know, having more than one dominant quadrant? Yes, of course. For example, um, suppose if you're very high blue and low on red, you would never, you would never think about the emotional elements much at all. Okay. But suppose mm -hmm. if you're balanced in the sense you have both blue and red at the same time, you're likely to think of both these issues at the same time, and therefore face a dilemma because you see both areas equally well. A dilemma is when you see what others don't. For example, if there's no, there is no dilemma if you don't see it at all. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah. so the very fact yeah. that we are, you know, in the dilemma means you're thinking about more. Absolutely. More. And then you, and if you, and if you look at look at the way you think, you recognize why you think this way, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just got to manage that that dilemma and, and, and think through it because you know that you are going to look at both opposing quadrants and it is going to cause you that kind of a, you know, uh, some anguish, a little bit of pain because of you're looking in both areas, which 
at this point of time appear incompatible, but they can be sorted out if you think through it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So another participant has raised a question that yes. suppose if we are failing in one particular quadrant, okay. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, what should we do? Should we adapt life according to, uh, you know, uh, that the, that missing quadrant, or uh, should we, you know, look at being more versatile and how how to go about doing that? The purpose of sharing these quadrants with you is to recognize that there is not one way of looking at things, right? So you have, for example, in some cases, thinking from one quadrant is not going to help you. You have three other quadrants that you need to, to visit and use and exercise that actually make you uh, more effective. For example, um, now, if you're very high red, okay, um, you're very strong on relationships, okay? But you might meet someone who will take full advantage of the fact that you're red and willing to go all the whole mile with you and your ability you know, to provide service and do everything and yet not give you the kind of uh, outcomes you receive. At, the, at some point of time, you might need to go into blue and say no. You, know, you need to assert yourself. You need to be critical. You, know, you need to think critically because just being red, just having one mindset is not going to be effective in this situation. So straight to answer your question, you have to first recognize the situation, look at the thinking required for the situation. And if you're aware of how you think, you also know that there are other options that you may not be looking at because that's not how you think, but are necessary in this given situation to make a difference. Fair, fair enough. I think, uh, uh, Prasad, we are getting a lot of questions on how uh, to identify our current dominant quadrant and, uh, you know, on how, you know, where to go and what to do. So if you don't mind, can you explain once again a little bit about uh, the HBDI assessment and, uh, you know, what is required for that and how should they go about it? Um, one of the things that Ned Herman did many years ago was to develop an instrument that enabled him to actually identify the preferences that we have, which is the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. It's a 120 question instrument that's, you know, that's blind administered. It's a very interesting uh, tool that actually visually helps you uh, understand uh, how you think. Okay. So when you complete the instrument, you will receive a profile, okay, which will, which will sort of explain to you which quadrants you are, you know, how you are placed in each of these four quadrants, along with a, a numerical and a visual analysis, along with a complete booklet that tells you exactly, you know, some of the issues that, you know, the things that you need to do differently. There's also an app, Shrey, that, you know, that comes along with the instrument. So once you take an instrument, you will receive a password and a code for an app where, which, where you can, look at your profile on the app, download it. It also tells you how to guesstimate other people's thinking preferences. Uh, it's a very powerful thing. For example, uh, if you want to know how your boss thinks or your colleague thinks or someone who's important to you thinks or stakeholder thinks, you could actually come out with a very good estimate and compare that with your own thinking and then understand what it is that you need to do differently given the differences in thinking so that you can engage with that person more effectively. Suppose, for example, you find out that that person is far more blue and you're red. Uh, you need to you need to tune in to that person. All these four quadrants are like radio stations. Okay, what's what are we trying to do here? We're trying to find out which station and how do I tune in to someone and engage with them so that I can communicate with them. I can take decisions more effectively. So what happens is after this. They will receive a mail, probably from you, of course, which will give them a process, a link, a web link that will enable them to go online and complete this profile. And after that, um, it, you know, if they choose to, I could spend half an hour with each one who's completed the profile and actually, you know, help them debrief their profile for them online, of course. And that's important because, you know, every profile has a different story. and 
during that half an hour, what, what we would do is we would debrief the profile and also identify two or three things that they would need to do going forward or they could do going forward based on their thinking that will enable them to be more effective in the given situation, personally as well as professionally. Does that make sense, uh, Shreya? Yeah, fair, fair enough. I think that should answer the questions regarding how to go about uh, you know, assessing which quadrant you're dominant in. So uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, so uh, one person uh, from our audience uh, actually works with people uh, who are um, uh, physically disabled. Okay. okay. And um, um, uh, he is having a particular challenge with his superiors with respect to, um, you know, hiring such people. Uh, and, wow. um, um, you know, the, the superiors feel that uh, it is um, uh, better to have two people who are paid 5,000 rupees per month rather than having one, uh, you know, uh, very good person who's paid 10,000 rupees a month or so. So, you know, uh, there's, there's a difference in thinking. Sorry? Uh, uh, having one person who's disabled paying 10,000 rather than two people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, okay. uh, you know, he's having a, a, a challenge of uh, convincing them uh, for, uh, you know, these kind of matters. And uh, he believes that his superiors have great vision. They are very hardworking. Uh, but uh, there are some practical things that they do not accept. So uh, he's, he, he's just asking for your opinion of what he should do to, you know, um, uh, kind of convince their superiors. Convince the superiors to hire a disabled person, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. One of the things that, obviously, uh, one of the things that immediately come to mind is uh, the fact that you're looking at a disabled person, you know, might make you more red, okay, because you're compassionate and you really want to, you know, you feel for that person and you want to ensure that he comes on board. But the best way to look at this is to be dispassionate about this. And go into yellow, go, go into blue and, and, and green, especially blue, and do an analysis dispassionately with facts on how disabled people, so-called disabled people, are actually, are actually far more effective in their jobs, regardless of their disability, simply because of who they are. If he can get data from the net or from other organizations that employ this, okay, with productivity, uh, you know, figures and ratios, which show that uh, hiring a disabled person not only gets someone who's highly able, but someone who's motivated and committed over a longer periods of time. Okay, that might make them change their mind and not focus on the disability at all. Focus on the unique uh, contribution that a person who's differently challenged can make. Okay simply because they are more capable in different in other ways that might help a lot without focusing on you know it's not it's not pity or charity or anything else. you're not doing a, you're not doing anyone a favor by hiring a disabled person you're actually doing yourself a favor because the facts and the data support this uh, decision does that make sense okay. great yeah yes yes mostly so uh, uh, another participant is asking uh, about uh, developing uh, all four quadrants um, yes. uh, and he's asking whether there should be a balance uh, between all four quadrants or is it all right if uh, a, a quadrant or two is more dominant in the style of thinking? See, it's all right if, if one or two quadrants are too dominant because that's, that's not in your hands, right? Uh, we are who we are. I'll come back to what we're saying because of nature and nurture. So if I'm more high blue and high green and low on yellow and red, that's who I am. And that's fine. That's perfect. That's who I am. That's ideal. However, the consequences of my thinking that I need to be aware of. So in many situations, this type of thinking works, but in situations which requires taking risk or, you know, doing venture, venturing outside your comfort zone, that's when you might need to stretch into yellow and red. That's all you need to be aware of what is, what are the inertia forces that prevent me from doing certain things what's my mindset that prevents me from actually engaging in a way that's necessary in a given situation 
those are the questions we need to ask ourselves yeah great so um uh, what is more important uh, knowing yourself or changing yourself and um, uh, the same participant is also asked uh, is um, uh, do we know ourselves enough in order to change ourselves or do we need external help to do that in your opinion see i'm also, i'm a very firm believer that we are most of us have enough self awareness and many times about who we are okay that's true so what the hbdi does is helps you become it helps you translate your own inner awareness in terms of your thinking preferences right since it's a self administered test so by answering this question what it does is translates your awareness into a profile that enables you to understand what it is the areas that you're good at you you prefer and those quadrants which you don't prefer now answering your second question um this is not about changing who you are this is more about being situationally changing your thinking this is about changing your thinking and therefore behavior situationally so that it is effective now suppose you now suppose you uh, i knew someone for example uh who should get along with with a few people whom not everybody really liked neither did i and i should stay away from them but he used to go ahead and engage with them and work with them and make it happen okay because that person who he used to engage with was very good at coding this is a software company an extremely good guy but you know in many ways very difficult to deal with so when i asked him uh, you know you're the one of few people um, who like this person and get along with him he says you're mistaken i don't like him that's irrelevant what's important that this person can contribute more effectively and therefore for me um i will i will do what it takes um and be focused so that he can contribute to our project at this point of time be extremely clear logical about his approach and that's what i mean um you know you can actually one can actually become more um stretch one change one's behavior at this point of time once one knows how one thinks it's not changing who you are it's changing my approach and be more flexible in our approach mhm mm yeah yeah okay so um i think we have another set of questions which uh, uh is asking how do we develop our thinking in all four quadrants um uh, we know that the first step towards that is to identify which of the quadrants you are want to build through by taking the hbdi assessment but then post that um, uh, there would be a deep debrief call with you but how do we you know kind of regularly work towards developing the four quadrants in our thinking stack so one is obviously um, one is obviously being such you know um, aware of how you think and the implications of your thinking so along with the book along with your profile you know the app will give you a lot of guidance here it gives you a lot of details in terms of for example what what are the areas that we focus on which helps you be more effective as you go forward one is communication okay decision making problem solving okay uh are some of the areas that we uh, you know um and leadership as well you know uh, engaging with other people so these are the four areas that uh, you will get detailed um uh, suggestions practical suggestions on how to start becoming better in all these areas that's one the other is um is is to is to is to constantly keep in mind and this is what has worked with other people um is the fact that being situationally whole brain is really the key and also to move away from just tolerating uh, uh, differences to actually honoring differences which means actively seeking out people who can uh, who think differently than you actively seeking them out and secondly uh, actively looking at situations where you need to stretch yourself in other quadrants of thinking um that is a great way of actually becoming more flexible 
uh, in the way you think. The, the, the key word is actively seeking this out. Sure. Great. So uh, we have a participant who asks that if he, if he is more dominant in the A and B quadrants, that is yeah. the blue and yellow, and but his partner is dominant, uh, uh, sorry, that is the blue and green, and uh, his partner is dominant in the C and D, which is the red and yellow. Uh, it would be a disaster if they don't get along, right? So how, how should he go about managing this? And I think what he is hinting at is uh, how do we actively, uh, you know, interact with people with different thinking? Yeah, <laughs> correct. I think, um, absolutely. So, most successful, when a partner, okay, personally, for example, most successful marriages are people who opposites attract. We find that many of them are actually quite different in the way they think. Because we actively seek people who don't have what we have, okay, or who have what we don't have. Now the question is, of course, how do you get along? Uh, I think what you, the way you get along is to is to accept and understand that the way people think and you think differently than you adds actually a lot of value to what you do, and being cognizant of that makes a big difference. And there are different ways, for example, in terms of skills, in terms of approaches that we can you know uh, discuss and find out specific to a situation what that person would need to do. Uh, to you know, be more uh, to manage some to work with someone who who thinks differently, but it can be an extremely productive uh, situation for both because uh, you learn most from someone who's different than you, and uh, it's actually uh, you know from a creative perspective, uh, professionally, it's a it's a it's a great idea to have uh, people who who are more diverse than you are. I think there's a lot of focus, uh, Prasad, on uh, uh, identifying the people uh, you're interacting with and identifying how they think. So yes. uh, needless to say that uh, uh, you would not, you know, subject them to an assessment to identify how they think. So what what would be the indicators or the key tips that, um, you know, in a conversation uh, will help you understand how the person in front of you thinks? And accordingly, you you know mold your interaction to him towards him. One of the biggest advantages of doing the HPDI is not the HPDI, sir. Okay. It's your it's developing an outward focus. If you notice, most of us are self-absorbed in the way we, when we engage with people. We're only thinking inwardly, okay, and thinking about you know our own challenges, our own issues, what to say next. We're not paying enough attention to the other person. So now, after the HPDI, if you pay attention to other people, really pay attention, you'd be able to pick up patterns and clues about how they think and how they behave. And that paying attention to those patterns and clues is really the heart of being more effective. Because we don't, we don't, we don't see what we don't see. Okay. You'll find that a person who is very difficult actually has many aspects about him that make him you know, far more um, you know, he's actually far more people oriented than what you make him out to be. It's just that you're taken in by the initial appearances. So are you paying attention to that person? Paying attention, don't making snap judgments because, you know, that's how you see things. And if you can do that, pay attention, not make snap judgments. You'd be able to engage with people, recognize the thinking styles for who they are and actually tune in more effectively. And when you do that, um, you'll find that people are not difficult, they're just different. And there's, it's really fun finding out how different they are. And it's also very rewarding. Okay. That awareness of other people and the, and, the, and the ability to pay attention, to my mind, are the huge and the biggest advantages of doing the HPD. Interesting. It's not about so that brings us to the last question for the day, Prasad. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, a participant is asking, what is the role of conscience uh, yes. in determining uh, which quadrant is dominant for us? And okay. since conscience changes over time, uh, you know, what will be the effect of time in our, you know, entire thinking journey? Okay. So. Could you come again, please, with that? 
So uh, the the question is, uh, what is the role of conscience uh, yeah. in defining our thinking style? Okay, and um, uh, since conscience changes with time, uh, how would the passage of time affect our, you know, evolution of thinking? Um. Um, that's interesting. You see, um, when you say evolution of thinking, I'm not quite clear by what you mean by that, sir. So, um, generally the progress in the thinking of an individual. So, you know, uh, the development of how the person thinks. Yeah, see, um, a lot of, see, if the, if the, if the mental demands of your tasks don't change, it's unlikely that the way you think will change. But if you start experiencing and if you actively experience new challenges, new tasks, new mental challenges, you will find that your thinking will change over a period of time. Okay. So your thinking isn't going to change just if you, if you remain where you are for, for some years. It won't. Your thinking is likely to change if you move around do new stuff, uh, challenge yourself. It will enable you to be more flexible. In fact, what we've discovered is that CEOs typically, are, the probability of a CEO being whole brain is much higher simply because in his journey, he has uh, moved around and done so many different things. It's naturally, it's just natural for him to develop a whole brain approach to, to any situation, many of them. Okay, not all, of course, but a, but a higher percentage of them. Yeah. So, but is conscience, our conscience, an important factor in how we think? Um, conscience is, uh, it's how you call things out, right? Okay. So, you yeah. can be dominant in any four, four quadrant, and still, if you don't have a conscience, uh, you can still be, you know, who you are, right? A conscience is, is deeply related to who you are as a person, okay? Not necessarily related to who you, how you think as a person, okay? For example, I can be, I can be high red, okay? That doesn't mean I have a high conscience for other people. It just, it could just mean that I'm very sensitive to what other people tell, talk, tell me, and I'm completely insensitive to what happens to others. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree. So there's a fair amount of uh, difference between conscience and how you think. Yes, I could be very, very self-serving in the way I think. Okay. And I have absolutely no conscience for other people. That's who yeah. I am. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Prasad, for that wonderful webinar. This brings us to the end of it. And uh, I'm sure our audience has gained great insights on their thinking styles and what they can do better at thinking cl uh, clearly. Uh, many thanks to all of you for being attentive and for those wonderful questions which have enriched this webinar for everyone. As mentioned by Prasad, you will receive an email after this webinar with information on the next steps to improve your thinking skills. Please look out for that email. Thank you once again very much for joining us. Uh, and please don't forget to fill in the feedback at the end of the webinar. Uh, this will only help us deliver to your expectations. Have a great day and goodbye.